My name is Penn Gillette, it's my partner Teller. We are Penn and Teller, and we are in Cairo, Egypt. And we're gonna be searching for the Gali Gali men, the street performers, street magicians of, um, of Cairo. It's the, uh, it's the street magicians. We're in, uh, are you getting this? Did you, were you able to hear me during this? So here we are on the very busy streets of Cairo looking for some street performers. Let out your clutch. Well, I don't know how they would work these streets without getting killed. <laughs> Walk proudly. You're half of Ben and Teller. It's Ben and Teller. They're on the road together, but their magic carpet's just a dirty rug. So long, Las Vegas. They'll go someplace contagious and get infected by the magic bug. Around the world, down exotic streets to gaze upon amazing and disgusting feats. Adventure calls, have you got the cups and balls to stomach blood and guts and gore and more? Come join them as they travel and the mysteries unravel on the magic and mystery tour. The cups and balls is probably one of the oldest tricks in magic. Back in Vegas, we do our own version. But the Gali Gali men of Egypt did it first. Gally, 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 gally. Hundreds, maybe thousands of years ago. Before Penn and Teller, Ed Sullivan was the guy you counted on to bring the world to your living room. In New York, before going to Europe, and the greatest of all magicians and you youngsters at home are really going to love him, the great Gali Gali. So let's have a right there. In 1949, he introduced us to one of the first Gali Gali men to make his way out of Egypt. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Look closely, I have right up the table three empty cups. Born Mahgoub Hanafi in 1902 in Port Said, Egypt, the magician known as Luxor Gali Gali comes from a long line of street performers and is one of the rare few to make a name on the world stage. His trademark trick was, indeed, the cups and balls with a little Egyptian twist. But what of his descendants? We've been told that the Gali Gali men are now gone. They're a thing of the past. But we're not sure that's true. So, being the adventurers that we are, we decided to see if we can find the Gali Gali men, the street magicians of old Egypt, for ourselves. Henry, come on, Henry, come on. Oh, don't hit the child. Food. You know, there's wow. nothing Teller and I like more than embracing a new culture. Cuisine? We're not going to eat anything. We have, in our hotel rooms, we have cans and cans of tuna fish shipped over here from Canada. <laughs> well, you know, one of the best things about going to a new place is trying the cuisine, trying you know? The food. I mean, and it's, there's some amazing dishes and here. That's also that a good be... way to lose 30 pounds. Well, so, you never know. You I mean, it I'm could missing... be a fly that lands on you <laughs> that's going to give you the disease that's that you've true. never Meet had. You know? Shona, it's our guide, show. translator, yeah. and when she's looking where she's going, our driver. Well, you know, I wouldn't here. eat the street food. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So although we're not, you know, germophobic Howard Hughes, we are falling into that role. You're becoming one agent. We are. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I won't be growing my fingernails out, but I am from Vegas. <laughs> so we're, we're being very careful. Being, so I uh, had um, tuna fish on crackers, and then I had tuna fish on crackers. The uh, Gali Gali men of, uh, of Egypt, we kind of think are our last chance. You know who they are, the Gali Gali men? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those of you that don't know, the uh, Gali Gali men are, uh, are street magicians. They used to perform for all the tourists and I guess also for the locals. But they did a different kind of magic than uh, the kind of stuff we picture in the States. And we are not particularly liked by Western magicians. I mean, uh, we thought maybe the Gali Gali men would like us because one, they couldn't understand us, which is always <laughs> a big advantage. And two, we do smaller things. Like, we're gonna have you pick a card. Just uh, tell us gonna okay. ripple down the deck all and right. just say, Stop whenever right. you like. Uh, stop. Oh, that's a good place. Now look at the card. I'm not going to look at it. Okay. I'll be looking over at the pyramids in the far distance. And now that card's lost. Then watch his hands. Let me <laughs> misdirect you. Right. Stare at his hands. We nothing fancy here. And so uh, these magicians, these Western magicians, with their big stage shows, they've got you know boxes and they torture women and they got a smoke machine. Oh, what are you ready? Ready? And is this your card? Two of diamonds. Yeah. There it is. Show. No, not the two. Not of course, not two of diamonds. We wanted to prove there was a two of diamonds in the deck because we thought you might be skeptical. Right. They have okay. wind machines, smoke machines. 
Machines, Bad White Boy, Motown Music. Seven of Hearts, is that your no, card? That's not it. Of course it's not your card, because it changes magically to your card, which is the Four Clubs. No. Oh, we're getting closer, no. though. Sorry. And, no. uh, yes. Now, but look at all the different cards in the deck. All, all different. So they have this whole style of doing magic that's different from ours, in that uh, we now have the... Three of Hearts, always a popular no. card, probably the one you didn't pick, because the Three of Hearts changes magically into the Two of Clubs. That's your card? No. So, no. Okay, so we're not liked by Western Magician, but the Galley Galley men would love us. And somewhere, Shona, in this big, beautiful city, we're going to yeah. find the Magicians of Cairo. <laughs> and is that your card? <laughs> three of Clubs. That's it. Yes. <laughs> right on his back, the Three of Clubs. How do you get that card there? And how do you make it so know. big? <laughs> Look at There's mosques and, and people and falafel stands. Galley, 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 Galley! Galley, 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 Galley! Galley, 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 Galley! This is Teller uh, brushing his teeth with uh, with bottled water. I mean, Teller has goggles here that he wears in the shower so that he doesn't get stuff in his eyes when he's showering. And he actually put tape over his mouth to shower so he wouldn't get any uh, microbes in there. So, you know, we're Penn and Teller and uh, we're here in Egypt. So you don't have to go. And don't mind that person there, one of the people that works with us. We were told that if there were street performers anywhere in Egypt, they would be in the cafes on Muhammad Ali Street in Old Cairo. They come here to swap news and look for work. <laughs> of all the magicians, someone called Karam is said to be the best and is rumored to be a relative of Luxor Galigali. Karam hasn't shown up yet, but some other magicians have. Our first taste of Egyptian magic, the Chinese slinking rings. I was sick of that trick in the United States, but I didn't like it over here. You know, the more you see it, it grows on you. I got into magic when I was about 12 years old, and I was sick of the linking rings by the time I was 13. Seems like every guy and his brother and his camel do the uh, do the linking rings. I'm starting to pick up the subtleties of it. The linking rings, if properly done, is all about the ambiguity of light. It's all about the ambiguity of these gleaming things which look so much like they're linked and then, uh, you know, a second later look so much like they're unlinked. The overlapping looks so similar to the linking. There's a visual ambiguity that's quite, quite a beautiful. I thought I would show this old guy my closing linking ring move. Do it. And he tried it, and he tried it. He tried to follow what it was that I was doing, and I showed him a second time. But there's just such a completely different way of thinking about magic that it didn't connect with him. Saying that's great. Trying to pass this piece of technical information across the language barrier and not quite succeeding was um, a very powerful sort of a, a very powerful sort of moment. And then Karam shows up, just back from performing in Dubai. We heard he's good, very good, and we're eager to see just what he can do and to find out if he is in fact related to Luxor Galigali. Oh boy, the Chinese linking rings. But, but that's just his warm up. <laughs> and then it's our turn to show the cafe some magic Penn and Teller style. Although we're upstaged by the waiter in the corner. Why don't you reach in there and take anyone you want? How about you? 
Okay, now you look at it. You show it out of the other people. What in this? Tell her we'll do the same over there. What in this? But Michelin. Okay, put, no, put it right back in there. Put it all back in there. We'll put it back in here. And we will uh, lay them out on the table here. And now we have the Mystic Needle of Cairo. <laughs> now the cards are in there. Tell her takes the needle and inserts it into his arm. And now, the needle through the arm. Tell her bleeds on the cards a little bit. And would you tell me, please, sir, which one of those cards has the most blood on it? I can't handle them actor. You take a look at it? Is that one of the cards? Number two. Is that yours? Thank you. Okay. We have the uh, dual spades. They were supposed to find your card, is that right? Now to do that, Bella first bandages his arm, and now takes a uh, takes a razor blade, and to show you that it is indeed sharp, and watch carefully, Della takes his eye, holds it open, <laughs> and the card appears miraculously on my forehead. Is that your card there? Is that your card? Wonderful, wonderful laugh. It's just delightful. <laughs> There's no business like show business. I've done some glass eating in the carnival, and I know some glass eaters. And he was, uh, he was showing off a lot. He was eating bigger bites than he really should have been. Yum. So last night we met our first magician, Karam. What can he tell us about the Golly Golly men and their cups and balls? And is he a direct descendant of Luxor Golly Golly? We've driven north to Ain Shams, a poor residential district on the outskirts of Cairo. This is where Karam lives, in a tiny two-room apartment with his mother, his wife, and his five kids. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Um, his grandfather, he was in America and he was a Gali Gali man. And that's how he learned from his grandfather who taught his father and then his father taught him. Your grandfather uh, worked in America? For 50 years that he became known there as a magician. What, uh, what name? Can you say Mahboub. His name is Mahboub. Do you know So Karam says his grandfather's name is Mahboub and Luxor Gali Gali's name is Mahboub. How many Mahboubs could there be? Now, there was a famous Egyptian magician in the U.S. called uh, Luxor Gali Gali. Oh, that's him. Oh, that's him? That's him. Oh, yes. He was on uh, all sorts of shows. He had Sullivan show, and he was worked the Rainbow Room in New York, and he was... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Those are his, his father's, and his and uh, Mahboub used to, used to work from, with these, specifically, these cups. They're, so you can tell they're old, and they've got the indentations, because they're old. If you went back and looked at old photos of him, you'd see these photo, these in the photos. Was there a photo in that, in that book? There was, wasn't it? Yep, yep. Yeah. And, uh... There are the cups. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. There you go. Those are them. Yeah. Yeah, he lived in uh, he lived in Las Vegas, where they where they also have pyramids. Um, are are any of his family still living in in Vegas? في أهل أهل محبوب في لاس فيجاس الأيام دي. لا كله بصي كان آخر حاجة أنا جدتي ميت على. He's saying his grandmother she died. في أولاد بس هم عارفوش. There are there are relatives, but he doesn't know them at all. They're not in contact with each other. Huh. Mahu performed in Luxor, Egypt, for the likes of John D. Rockefeller, J. P. Morgan, and the Aga Khan. He adopted the stage name Luxor Gali Gali for the place of his initial success. Though Karam never met his relative, their style seems to be the same. They even resemble one another. Small chicken. I have it right up the table. Little small chicken in line. Now one chicken, exactly two. Watch the cup nearest the camera. Can you see him slip a third ball underneath? 
It's classic Egyptian cups and balls. But then Karam is interrupted by his mother, who also wants to get in on the act. So, how cool was that? Oh, thank you so much. <clears throat> See, I, this is what happened here. I admired Teller's bottle of water, so he brought it over to me. That's what happened with the, with the egg bag. Uh, Teller was trying to compliment her on how good the egg bag was, and he ended up uh, getting it as a gift. You see, in our culture, the United States of America, if you say, boy, that's a really nice BMW, the guy goes, uh, yes, it is. But over here, you say that's a really nice egg bag, and they uh, they uh, they give you they give you the egg bag. So this is the egg bag that was given to Teller by Karam's mother. <laughs> but even if Karam is from a long line of golly golly men and street magicians, he's never performed in the streets in his life. He says he's just a regular magician with a stage show. And it's enormous. It's, it's, it's you know, it, it's big. It's, um, big. The Sphinx, the Sphinx is big. It's very big. I, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I can figure that out I myself. I got the black yeah. one here. Oh, my goodness. This is uh, Nefertiti. Nefertiti, yeah. Yes, and I got the bigger one. I dated her in high school. But, you know, this looks a lot like Cher. You don't, you don't have any Elvis memorabilia, do you? Do you have any with Elvis on it? This is the uh, we're from the U.S. We, we liked our pyramids with Elvis. You're yeah, American? Yeah. God bless America, buddy. <laughs> and how much is this? $10. $10? That's not cheap. That's, no, no, $5. $5. Yes. It's, it's worth more than 5 I'll give you 7 for it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. They expect, they expect you to bargain. I have the whole schmear here. Sure, I'll give you the whole schmear. The whole schmear? From the evil eye. Yeah, I haven't had any problem. evil eye away. I have no evil eye problem. <laughs> I would get in the evil eye here. This is one more for gift. No, I don't want that papyrus. You want no, I don't want. I don't want. This papyrus. is for gift. No, I have a computer now. Oh dear. Make bill. Hi, hon. Hi, hey. Do I just get on like this? Ship of the desert. The what? The, the ship, ship of the, of the desert. Yes, I know. The ship <laughs> of the desert. Avast ye mateys, I'm on the ship of the desert. Hold tight. I'm holding back. Oh, Be harder. Oh, sorry. Uh, hello, Kim. I'm on a camel now. Yeah, we're trying to find magic. And he, this is Daisy. I'm, yeah. This is Daisy the camel. He's going to get nice plate, nice t-shirt. This was an exciting new experience on a on a spitting beast that wanted me dead. These are the uh, the actual cups used for the cups and balls by uh, by Penn and Teller. And uh, this is the land where the cups and balls started thousands and thousands of years ago. And as you saw in the cafe, it's still being done. We do it in the United States of America with plastic. They do it here with the metal cups. The ones that Karen was using was, uh, were over 150 years old. One, two, three. Last night, Karam did a trick for me in which he had three cups and three balls. He put one ball under each cup, and then after a certain amount of chat, revealed that there was one ball under each cup. A normal person looking at it would say, so what? But to a magician, this was an absolutely terrific trick. Because when he covered the first ball, he apparently stole that ball out and palmed it. 
And when he covered the second ball, he apparently inserted the ball that he had palmed. And when he covered the third cup, he apparently stole that ball out, and then he took one more look under the second cup. So to somebody like me, who's thinking about moves, I thought that he had snuck the balls from each of the end cups under the center cup. And then he asked me, how many balls are under each cup? And I said, one, one, one. That's because I was playing the role of a sucker, right? I was, I was saying, okay, I'll be, a, I'll be nice to him. I'll be nice to this, to this guy from this foreign country. I'll pretend to be a spectator. And then he lifted the cups. And lo and behold, it was one, 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 when I was absolutely sure that there were all three under the middle because I had seen him do the slights. It was absolutely amazing. And he completely took me in. And I don't think there's a nicer thing that you can do for a fellow magician than use his knowledge to fool the heck out of him. It's really pure magic for magicians and really uh, cross-cultural cross and, uh, and very, very mean-spirited and totally snaked the little guy. <laughs> do you like my hat? Do you think, do I look like a tourist? I'm worried about that. How about some Las Vegas magic here in the Egypt desert? See those pyramids? <laughs> Remember what they look like, because pretty soon, they'll be gone. Golly, golly, golly. Golly, golly, golly. And gone. And until they vanish, the pyramids. Okay, we've seen the pyramids. And now back to looking for the Gali Gali men, the street magicians of old Egypt. No one knows how many people live in Cairo, but my best guess is 17,272,423. And every one of them drives. It's the second most polluted city in the world. Now, Cairo is a beautiful city full of friendly, wonderful people, and we enjoy everybody we met. But the air in Cairo, there's 17 million people in this little basin with no wind. And uh, it's the feeling of being locked in a hermetically sealed uh, uh, closet with uh, a rubber hose coming off the exhaust pipe of a 1962 Chevy V8 uh, being revved. Golly golly men used to board ships and entertain passengers with their tricks in Alexandria. Why not look there? <laughs> Maybe the air's cleaner. <coughs> Alexandria, named after Alexander the Great, home of Cleopatra, and also home of Mustafa of Alexandria, a magician, also called Bafa, who, if we're lucky, is going to swallow a snake for us. By his own admission, the greatest magician in all of Egypt. Bafa's signature trick is a snake swallow. He's out in the countryside trying to catch a snake, and we're on our way to find him. I'm still dealing with a little bit of my Cairo cough and congestion, but um, I'm still, uh, it can't keep me down. And when you see me watching the trick, I'll have a proper tie on Bafa says he invented the snake swallowing trick and he's the only magician in Egypt who can do it. Okay. Did Bafa find a snake? You see, Bafa doesn't just catch snakes. He claims he can hypnotize them by repeating religious texts. Okay. <laughs> I feel remarkably like Judy Garland as Dorothy. And they're sheep and children. Goats and, and geese. <laughs> geese and ducks. Goats, I think. Sir, 
Have you, I like it. <laughs> have you, uh, have you found a snake? Lay it tabern henna? Lay it to henna? Wallahi? Fine. He said he found one. Oh, good. Well, that's a well, snake. I'll just stand back a bit. <laughs> that's a nice one. It's molting a little bit, huh? <laughs> this is so hmm? great. And shoe for lava, Yanil. Well, let's get a little bit of a crowd. You want to do it for the kids? And now a little What? Yeah. I don't know if that snake is the best crowd gathering I've ever seen. The snake doesn't seem to exactly pull him in. Now, if you're going to swallow a snake, you really don't want to be doing it with one that's shedding its skin. So although this might look like a man chasing a bunch of kids with a snake, to a magician, it's classic misdirection. Because in all the confusion, Bafa switched the snake he'd found for another one in his pocket. like to me, like he uh, put a snake in his mouth and uh, had it come out of his mouth. I'm very happy with that. You like that? Uh, you like that? Good. You like that? Is that a good trick? Is that a good trick, huh? Very good trick. We're all very happy with this. We spent an hour with Bafa on the pier in the harbor talking about his life as a magician. Born and bred in the city, he used to perform on the ships passing through this ancient port. It's a place full of history and faded glory. Said he's been a magician for 35 years. Can under Kamsano He began when he was seven years old. He said that he would he would stand on the on the pier next to the ship and start doing tricks and the foreign the tourists would see him and say, Oh, nice small boy, you know, come and perform for us and they would lift him up into the boat. Oh great. And he would perform for them. He shows us the first trick he learned on the pier as a child. Bafa the Great of Alexandria, a real golly golly man still performing on the streets. Back at the hotel, we start to think about Bafa's performance in the village. He had this snake thing in the mouth he invented, which the snake thing in the mouth is this whole level of trick that's very, very different from magic. It's more just, uh, it's more equivalent to the kind of thing when you take a school bus in grade school, the kind of things you do to try to get the girls to throw up. It's much more of that kind of style of entertainment. 
it's a trick he does, a turban trick, which I guess we do three tricks with that same thing in probably, what, three minutes. He, you won't see this in real time because it wouldn't hold up for television, but he took about, what, 12 minutes? 15? 20? Long time to do the same trick very methodically. People stop and have conversations and then go back. It's a whole different, it is the opposite of the MTV generation. I mean, when he camps out there, he would just do it, different kids would come up and he, do it again, do it again. The kids kind of cycle through, and it's all very, very gentle. Nothing like that. There's just none of that stuff. It's just all very. I don't know if we ever got to know the real Baffa. The only thing we could find out is that he lives in the top story of a condemned apartment building in a seedy part of town. And the powers that be would let us film there. Like that one too? He's digging it all. He's digging it all. After uh, Baffa had finished his little show in the, uh, in the village, Teller went over and through our translator said that it was a really wonderful show and complimented him on the show and talked about some specific things that he'd really liked. And Baffa, of course, turned his back because when you're the great Baffa, what are compliments from Teller? Bafa of Alexandria couldn't be the only golly golly man. Was anyone still doing magic on the streets of Cairo? <laughs> Meet Sobi Ashmawi, golly golly man of Cairo. Pen. 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 My Say name Alan. is Teller. The whole Ashmawi family is golly golly. The son, the father, the grandfather, generation after generation of street performers. Like their ancestors before them, they work a crowd and pass a hat. Oh, yeah. I'm totally chickenless, sir. Uh oh, I have that kind of chicken in your suit field. The chicken is so happy in my suit. We didn't get the whole translation, but I think the Ashmawi family was claiming to have been golly golly since a couple of generations after Tyrannosaurus Rex. So, did the cups and balls trick really originate here in Egypt? We're heading about 200 miles south to the ancient tombs of Beni Hassan where we may find the earliest paintings of the cups and balls ever recorded. We're talking 4,000 years old. Ooh, the mystery of Beni Hassan. Ooh, the mystery, ooh. I gotta get out of Cairo, <coughs> I can't breathe. So we're gonna go uh, up the Nile, right to there, which is uh, Minya. And we're gonna leave our representation of Cairo, all of which ends up in your lungs, and we're going to go up the Nile of Cheese Whiz to Minya, where Teller will see the cups and balls, and I will be one of the huddled masses longing, longing to breathe free. Teller's sitting here with uh, Mortez, who's our uh, government minder. He's here to make sure that all the uh, wheels are greased, among other things, and uh, make sure that we uh, we make it each look good, which we're doing a fine job of. And Teller's just uh, playing with the cups and balls with, uh, with Mortez. 
When Teller was eight or nine years old, he was given a book called This Is Magic by Will Dexter. Teller learned that the cups and balls is known to be the most ancient magic trick because there were pictures of it on the walls of the Beni Hassan tombs in Egypt. <laughs> Since then, there's been some controversy as to whether or not that's true. Some people say it's not the cups and balls at all, but just a couple of guys playing some kind of game. But we're gonna see those tomb walls for ourselves. <laughs> Minya was a hotbed of Islamic fundamentalism. We're going here? And our government minders are visibly nervous about our security. Oh, we have an armed escort? Which one is our armed escort? They're all armed? <laughs> yeah, we'll have, we'll have our own private army. Are they going to let me bring my piece in? <laughs> <laughs> We've arranged to meet up with Lila Brock, an Egyptologist working in the Valley of the Kings. She'll go to the tombs with us tomorrow, but her train is running late. Uh, we've been typing in to our uh, little fan club on the internet about our adventures over here. Since they all heard at our little fan club that we were eating canned pears, they've decided to, uh, now it's 10 o'clock in the evening over here, and they're having uh, canned pears at just about uh, noon on the West Coast and we're enjoying it with the same size cans everything. We didn't tell them about the cheese whiz. <laughs> Getting on to midnight and Lila still hasn't made it. Uh, so, Lila, we've had people uh, with guns and trucks following us around all day, and uh, we're doing that to uh, to be here to go to this tomb. And what are we going to see in the tomb? Well, um, right now we're looking at this old volume by Percy Newbery. The Percy Benny, Newbery? The Percy Newbery, about Benny Hassan. And I'm just going to show you the illustration here. It shows two men. And uh, they seem to have four cups between them. Now, this is on the wall of a, of a tomb, right? Yes, of uh, someone called Back at the Third, and I think he was one of the governors of Benny Hassan during the Middle I, I guess what I don't get is this would be this guy's life story would be like, oh, you know, a lot of guys danced, and then these ladies danced, and we all applauded for them. We took some, some, uh, some cattle to market, and then we punished <laughs> some people, and then we did the cups and balls, and now I'm dead. Is that, is that, is that a it's not a very cheerful <laughs> life. <laughs> well, you know, it could be worse. You could be building pyramids all the Yeah, in some ways, it's a demonstration of his wealth and importance to show that, indeed, he like can he employ like... these many people. I kind of get the impression of what's going on here is he's lifting something up, and there's something underneath it. Or... Well, what do you think they're doing here, anyway? We could always edit this whole part out, but we'll just d d pretend a lot that this is, we're really sure this is the uh, cups and balls. It shouldn't take much to buy a Egyptologist to say, absolutely, <laughs> that's the cups and balls. We haven't wasted our time. How much could she cost? You could grace her easy. Oh, there's Benny Hassan. <laughs> Much better protected than you can see. They won't let us shoot anyone in uniform, which is 
more than half of the population of this particular group is in uniform and has weapons. There's even boats around us that have guns, turrets and stuff. But every time we try to shoot them, we get reprimanded. So uh, we're being reprimanded right now. They get a better gig than the city ones. The city beats the bird and have it tougher. In some of the tombs, they dig a shaft, and they uh, put the, in, with a little room down at the bottom, and they would have put the actual burial in there. And what we're seeing that we call a tomb is actually the visiting area. I see. For relatives to come and leave offerings. So I guess 15 is down to the left. Are these the numbers we're looking at, those 22 here? I think so, yeah. So that means we maybe have like seven to go? So it looks like it. I'm going to show off my math skills. Yeah, we're here. We're here. We're here. We're here. We're here. He's welcoming us to Benny Hassan. Thanks. Great sound. Great sound. You go first, I'm afraid. OK. <laughs> no, it treats in here. Ooh, hello, Ali. <laughs> you want to go ahead? Oh, man. That's it. Well, this would have been uh, very bright when it was first done, right? Oh, very bright. Brilliant color. There does seem to be something more than the fellow who's on our right. We can see his hand there. You think he might be holding something? I don't see anything at all, but Teller wants to take a closer look. <laughs> you see anything that could be uh, added there at all? We're really hoping to see some sort of uh, ball type thing. It's very hard to uh, look for cups and balls stuff because the whole room is just so... Uh, so awe-inspiring. I mean, even the way it sounds when you go, is uh, just uh, terrifying. And to think that those are up there for 4,000 years. Weird thing is we're staring here, and right over there, there's a guy pulling a rabbit out of a hat. <laughs> and, he looked over, and they're sawing a woman and a half over here, and we're looking at the intermission thing, you know? I'd like to take a, a much closer look. But this isn't the only ancient entertainment painting in the tomb. There's juggling, is there juggling? There is? Let's look at the juggling. Oh yeah, that's, well, that's clearly juggling. I started out as a juggler. That's, what, uh, that's where I started before I get into magic. I'm, I'm much happy about this. I guess once again, the jugglers have beat the magicians here. We have, a, we have, we have clear proof here that that's... Uh, Wow. And there might have been something here. See? Look at the red. It almost looks as if the artist originally had the pan in this position with something red in it, that's right. And then he changed his mind and took it out. It's hard to even think in here. It's hard to talk because the, the, the sound is so uh, reverent. You know, even when you, uh, even when you clear your throat, it sounds very, very important. It's all very... Uh, um, awesome, not in the California sense, but in the literal sense. And uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, I know that this, this thing is mostly on magic, but it's uh, the, uh, tangentially to see the, uh, the juggling is, is pretty great. It's really great.
We don't know uh, really whether that painting up there is indeed the Cups and Balls, but uh, we do know the Cups and Balls is done throughout the world and has been done uh, as far as we know forever. And this is our version of it that just uses uh, three plastic cups and uses three, in our case, aluminum foil balls. Simple props, simple moves. It's done like this. Watch carefully. Takes the ball, place in his hand, vanishes it, and it appears underneath the cup. Second ball, place in his hand, and it appears once again underneath the cup. It's a pretty simple plot. Takes the ball, place in his hand, pla oh, well, place it underneath the cup, and then it appears underneath the cup. Magically. Okay. Three cups, three balls. You take the center ball, place it underneath the center cup. Each of the side balls, put them away. And then underneath the center cup, there is a three ball party. Three balls underneath the cups. And then, little magic move, there's one more under the center cup, one more under either side, and of course, a potato for the finish. Is there a potato drawn up there at all? Now that's the way uh, it would have been done 4,000 years ago with, uh, we would hope that would amuse and amaze them, but it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't shock them at all. We wanted, at the end of the 20th century, to add something a little bit more American, a little bit different. So we decided to break a few rules of magic, uh, most of which go back probably uh, much more than 4,000 years. First rule of magic is you never do the same trick twice. We're gonna do the same trick twice. Second rule of magic is you never let the audience see your secret preparation. You can't let anyone know what is hidden in which pocket. The third rule of magic is you never tell an audience how a trick is done. I'm gonna tell you exactly how this trick is being done. And the fourth rule of magic, I guess the uh, pharaohs were never thought of, but uh, you never ever do the cups and balls with clear plastic. So here's the cups and balls again, this time in our version. We hit the first ball, but everybody's in our hand. Everybody already stuck underneath the first cup. We hit the second ball, simultaneously secrete underneath the cup, pretend to place it in our hand, and show it. We hit the third and final ball, pretend to place it in our hand, pretend to show it underneath the cup, place it in the cup, then secretly secrete it and reveal it. Now we're all set for the second half. Three cups all loaded, three balls on top. In the center ball, place it in the center cup. Each of the side balls, we put them away. We don't need them anymore. We have three duplicates underneath the center cup. With these three balls that come over here. Now this is not juggling. What this is called is misdirection. For so looking over here, tell us takes the final ball under. There's one more on either side. And of course, for our finish, a very Egyptian potato. Maybe it was the blistering heat or the exhausting climb of the side of the mountain. Maybe it was just the romance of standing in an ancient Egyptian tomb. But the more distance we put between us and, uh, and those wall paintings, uh, the less it seems like there's any chance that they were the cups and balls. It seems just as likely they were ancient Egyptian bongo players or something. There may have been a rich Egyptian tradition of magic, but sadly it seems to have faded unless you count reruns of the Ed Sullivan Show. The reason we think of Egypt is so magical is because American and English magicians at the end of the 19th century painted hieroglyphs on their props to make them look more mystical. But coming up into the uh, 21st century, if you want to find Egyptian magic, you're going to have to come here to Las Vegas, Nevada. How you doing? We're out of Egypt. Let my people go. You know, we've enjoyed all these uh, galley galley men in their cafes and on their streets and so on, but uh, the rings are nice and the cups and balls are nice, but uh, we're from the United States of America, Las Vegas. We like to do big tricks. So we're going to do something with the pyramids. How about we float one of the pyramids in the air? What do you say? Now watch carefully as the pyramid floats right in the air. Come on, 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 come Whoa, look at that! Golly, golly, golly! Oh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Golly, golly, golly! <laughs> now see, that's some American desert magic right out here in the Egyptian desert. Oh, that, that's astonishing. In the back. Ooh.